there could be a lot of assumptions made on our emotions. How we react to this with the slightest touch, the smallest reaction, could be an intake of breath, a lack of speech, not wanting to look into someone's eyes. This could be noted for what is said, or what is not said. Or even within the plot, of what we are given or not given based on the silence, or the constant talking. Emotions are a tricky thing, and some people are better at hiding them than others. We cannot possibly know what is going on in someone's head all of the time. But place that aspect of the unknown with drugs, and you have a mixture of abandonment of walls holding you in, and also the abandonment of the choice of free will letting you out. This is two takes, and this is one shot. An analysis of Spiderhead. Spoilers are ahead. Spiderhead seems to follow the same sort of recipe for a sci-fi about removing certain humanistic elements for the greater good. Think of equilibrium, equals, and I think we're alone now, to name but a few. There's always an element of the government controlling the masses through a manufactured drug that restrains or removes emotions. But what's so interesting about Spiderhead is that it is in the production of said drug that could do this. Films like I've mentioned before it has already happened and been approved based on either de desperation, for the need to stop wars and hate, or because the world is easier when emotions do not control you. Spiderhead goes further in its exploration by showing us the experiments and emphasising how precious these emotions are and how we express ourselves. We followed the story of Jeff and his interactions with Lizzie and Steve. Two important elements in what happens next. Lizzie for the importance of how loving someone truly can at all tools be manipulated, and Steve because we, the audience, get to understand his reasonings for such an elaborate plan. Sure, he wants to help the world, but these are words of grandeur. What is really happening is the making of an assortment of drugs based on the numbers and letters on a bingo card. Which makes me question whether scientists actually do this, and if they do, then I'm not surprised. The most crucial part of these experiments is all centred around B6, which everyone already has in their Moby packs. We discover it is the essential drug for overall obedience, and so, without any of us realising it, the whole all doors open policy that Steve expresses more than once is a lie. What is really being shown here is how successful B6 is. But look at it this way. All the inmates could be rioting at any moment, but they do not. When Steve announces Jeff and Lizzie are trying to run away, it doesn't take long for each inmate to run after them to stop them. And now we all know why. It's not for any respect or love for Steve and what he's done, it's because of what he's created that's being pumped into their system without their knowledge. We could go further on how insane B6 is, but the interesting theory of how everyone is always saying I acknowledge before each test. Acknowledging something is being aware that it's happening, it doesn't mean you agree with it. Technically, they are never agreeing to the tests, they are just saying they understand it is happening. So again, like the open doors policy that Steve lies about, this is another one to add to the list. All inmates are under the pretense of choice because there is no choice to begin with. Alongside B6, the drug named Lovatin, N40 is explored in more detail with a sinister play on love and intimacy. The goal isn't making anyone fall in love or helping those who haven't felt it before, like Steve keeps preaching. Oh no, it's more than that. It's how powerful the drug can be by taking all love away from the person. It's about removing the free will of love from the individual, hence the experiments of Dark and Flux and the choice of whom to put it on. This feeds onto the bingo card we see, wherein B6 is the main priority. The idea of producing ultimate obedience, where the person under its effects wouldn't question killing or hurting someone they love. Because we all know love and fear are very powerful emotions, and from what we have seen of the other drugs, fear has already been mastered, it seems. What is interesting is how love and fear are holding dominance, and how love is the last milestone before the bingo card is complete. These feelings of love and hate might have importance, like being big ones to conquer in these experiments, because they are projective, they are external, they are expressed and can affect others, 
whilst other emotions like shame and regret are mostly internal, only affecting the individual. And it seems this has happened to Steve, in a way. His story of his father abandoning him in foster care could be the main reason for his need of a drug that makes people obey you. Steve wants to play God so that children in the future are not abandoned. However, there is a sinister element when Steve admits that he wants to be six to essentially be able to override the love you have for someone so you can kill them. Like I said earlier, love and fear. And in this instance with Steve, hate is a powerful emotion that can fester and multiply. And in Steve's case, in this minor plot point that eclipses the whole reason for the experiments, which is a little unfair for Steve's character, but there you have it, hate is shown to be both internal, where he didn't have an outlet, and an external, when the drug is completed. With each emotion, whether they are good or bad, our minds have a system of using them within reason. But imagine the emotions you feel becoming stronger and stronger based on a dial on someone's phone controlling the intake. And then you are brought back down to baseline. You can have some essence of normal. But it's not normal. And so there are elements of after effects that present an underlying worry on the mind and what happens after the trials are over. Like with every drug, what goes up must come down. And it does with feelings of shame and sadness. However, basing this theory with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it can go further than when we include Dave in the experiments of hunger. The psychological needs, like air, food, water, shelter, etc., have already been met in the penitentiary. However, the experiments done on poor Dave in the background takes these needs to the next level. If these needs are not met, then a drug can instigate that want to fill this need, and so Things higher up on the hierarchy, like freedom, sense of self, intimacy, etc., are not registered. Would you rather feel temporary shame and sadness after feeling something amazing, or constant hunger because of a drug? These experiments go further because Steve doesn't know the difference of exploring human emotion and playing God. And all of this is done in a place named the spider head. It's a literal metaphor for the usage of a spider's head, which can come across like an intricate maze of the penitentiary, its exoskeleton being cast off from society so that experiments of emotions can take place without hesitation, consideration of others, and the constant lying under the facade of Steve being like your best friend. The building for the penitentiary is located on a secluded island that is accessible only by air or sea. Almost like it was a building that has been discarded from the mainland, much like a spider's exoskeleton. With the head of the operations, the rooms we see the experiments done in, being called the spider head, is only fitting because of its link to the literal spider's head. But let me explain. The main brain of the operation flows with the CCTV eyes of the operation, the cafeteria as a stomach, the glands, the entertainment rooms, and the legs being like separate sleeping quarters for each inmate all linked like a literal spider's head to this one segment. So, the whole operation of Ebnesti Pharmaceuticals is known to be open, with C reminding everyone of the open door policy, with corridors flowing in each room, as exoskeleton concept keeping it all secluded. And in real life, its seclusion only heightens this concept because of its location. inmates, having only a choice of prison or the spider head without really being told what is happening, have subjected their minds and bodies to things outside of their control. They have moldy packs attached to their nerve system on their backs with drugs pumped into them day and night to explore what will happen next. But it can be seen, especially with Heather on Darken Vlogs, that even in controlled environments, we as humans are unpredictable, and neither you or I or Steve can comprehend our next move. And there is freedom in that unknown quality. Freedom in knowing Steve is not a god after all. Through controlled experiments to the realisation that the inmates are controlled subtly by B6, there is a pretense of free will in everything they do, even the acknowledgement of experiments being done to them. When the drugs are in play, the aspect of control is questionable. But, knowing how unpredictable we can be, drugs cannot control everything. 
And that's where the beauty lies and how we can be. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed what was said, then please support the show from my Patreon. And if you want to know what's happening next, follow my Instagram. To know my day-to-day thoughts, follow my Twitter. And if you want to read what was said instead, then follow my blog, linked elsewhere. With your support, I can only make this better. So again, thank you from the bottom of my heart.